Hi, and welcome to Life, Death, and the Space Between podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Amy Robbins. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist and medium. And here we explore life, death, consciousness, and what it all means. Today, I have Dr. Jeffrey O'Driscoll on the show. Jeff practiced emergency medicine in a level one trauma center for 25 years and served as department chair for eight. He received his training at the University of Utah School of Medicine and completed his residency in Salt Lake City, Utah. He is board certified in internal medicine and is a fellow of the American College of Emergency Physicians. As an emergency physician, Jeff received messages that help him care for patients. Occasionally, they led him to a diagnosis he hadn't considered. Some people, however, were simply too ill or too injured to survive. And when a patient died, sometimes he saw their spirit, their eternal essence, leave their body. They always thanked him for his efforts they were always grateful. Knowing how they felt about their transition helps him when friends and family members left this realm. So I want to welcome Jeff back to the show today because I totally screwed up earlier and didn't record our podcast. (laughs) It's good to be back with you. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Talk about like eternally grateful. I'm eternally grateful in this realm that you are willing to do this again, because I was mortified when we got to the end of our last podcast and I realized it had not recorded. Well, we had a nice conversation. Redos are always better. I hope you're right, because it really was pretty, I thought it was pretty great, everything we talked about. So let's let's try it again. And let's start with where we started before, which was talking about your unconventional journey to spirituality. And you lost your brother when you were 15, or when he was 15. You were, were you nine at I the time? I was 11. 11 at the time. And uh, it wasn't until years later where you first really reconnected with him. Can you tell us about that a little bit? Yes. The, the first time I felt like I really reconnected with my brother was 20 years after his death when he came to me and he said, you need to go talk with our mother because there's things she's never told you about my death. In retrospect, I now see that my brother intervened a couple of times in my young life. I think he saved me from a fatal car crash when I was 16, but I didn't recognize that's who it was at the time. But this time he came in an unmistakable way and he sent me to talk with our mother and I went and visited with my mother. And that was the day she told me that she always knew where I was in the house before my brother died because she could hear me singing. My brother's name was Stan. She said, when Stan died, you stopped singing. Mm. So I thought I'd got, I thought I'd pass through my brother's death rather unscathed without any major psychiatric trauma. And, uh, That was when I first realized that it had a major primal impact on me and who I was. And and in fact, it caused me to have what I believe was a form of attachment disorder. I remember one day, 30 years after his death, I uh, had been chatting with a friend of mine who's also a physician and married to a physician and obviously a lot more comfortable with death than I am. And she had this huge palatial home. And I remember thinking how neat it would be to have a big house like that. And then I kind of backed up and I thought, no, I don't want a house like this. I don't want anything in my life that I care about. A person or thing, I don't want anything that I care enough about that it can hurt me when it leaves. And I remember pushing back from the computer and saying right out loud, that's not normal. Mm -hmm. And that was when I first realized that I'd build up this big wall to prevent me from ever caring about anything enough again that it could hurt me by leaving. And that was when I started taking down the wall and I learned about vulnerability and how we have to be willing to risk being hurt if we're going to love and be loved. And that was part of my journey back to a more spiritual realm. And your spirituality has kind of coexisted in the trauma room in many ways, but most people don't think of, of, emergency room physicians to be kind of out with their spirituality if they are at all spiritual. Usually it's very materialistic and physical. So what has that journey looked like for you and how did that evolve over time? Well, you're right. I 
<clears throat> I had a very typical Western medicine trained career and a very science-based, physical-based practice in the emergency department. But sometimes when people would die, they'd actually see their souls leave their bodies and they'd communicate with me before they left this realm. And I just kept it all to myself. I never spoke of it for over 20 years. And then one day after I stopped seeing patients, it just felt like it was okay to share. And I started to talk about it with a few close friends and, uh, and their response just amazed me. That was the first time I realized that not everybody had those experiences. And somehow sharing them helped them to heal and helped them to connect with their own spirituality. And it made me feel better about sharing. And in your book, you have a book out called Not Yet. You, you talk about your connection with the other Jeff, who you do a lot of speaking engagements with, Jeff Olson, who lost his wife and young son in a car accident, pretty tragically. And you met his wife, even though she was already dead, in the ER while Jeff was being operated on. Yes, um, Jeff Olson and I had never met when he was involved in a car crash that took the life of his wife and his uh, 14-month-old son. And he was flown from the scene of the, well, actually he was taken from the scene of the accident to a local hospital and then flown from that hospital to my trauma center. There was one other person in the emergency department that knew about my spiritual experiences and it was because she had her own experiences and we'd talked about it. And she came to me, Jeff Olson was taken to the trauma room and some other doctors were taking care of him. I wasn't going to be involved in his care, but she came and grabbed me by the arm and said, you have to come to the trauma room. And I said, why? She said, because she's there. I said, who's there? And she said, his wife, she's there. You have to come. So I went with her down to the trauma room and there was unconscious motionless Jeff Olson on the gurney with a team of professionals working on him and standing above him in the air was his deceased wife, Tamara, who, uh, expressed her profound gratitude for the care he was receiving. And we communicated uh, uh, while everybody else was doing their jobs. And it was one of those times when it was, it was like the TV show was still on, but somebody turned the volume down. Everybody else in the room was still communicating, mm -hmm. but it was all quiet for me. And we communicated telepathically, of course, silently. Uh, but there was this profound flow of knowledge, and I understood who she was and who her husband was, and I knew he'd live. I knew he'd lose his leg, and I knew uh, all of this as though I was experiencing it myself in a way for him and her. And uh, we sent him off to the operating room, and I went back out and finished my shift and went about my, my night's activities. And when you say you saw her, what do you mean by that? Like you saw an apparition, you saw her physical body. Well, sometimes, ghost sometimes form. I use words. Uh, when I see people, I usually see them in human form, uh, in the form of their physical body, but uh, in glory and light and perfection, if you will. And when I say, I, I, I try to avoid the word see sometimes because I, I like the word experience instead. When we talk about seeing, see from my doctor perspective, I uh, I imagine electromagnetic waves of light coming into my eyes and being focused by my cornea and my lens onto the rods and cones on my retina and being <laughs> converted to electrical signals that travel down my optic nerve and decussate uh, before they get to the opposite uh, uh, occipital cortex where they're processed and made into an image. <laughs> and when I see or experience things spiritually, I think it bypasses all of that and just goes directly to the image. And so other people in the room may not see it, even though I see it as if it was right there, uh, like anything else in the room. So, so I get the second part, not as much the first part. <laughs> you, can edit, <laughs> Which I guess, you can edit that part out. No, I love it. I love it because it really, like I, I, I understand what you're saying is it just seems clear even though visually with your visual eye, with your you know physical eyes 
you know, it's not like I'm looking at you in this moment right now. Right. It feels like I'm seeing it with my physical eyes, but other people standing next to me aren't seeing the same thing. Right. And so the process must be something different. And I, it, I, I think it's a spiritual process. It's like when I hear messages from people, the person standing next to me doesn't hear the message. But for me, it comes in sentences and it's very clear. And it comes with this profound knowing of, of just this... Uh, certainty of what it is and this expanded message which far transcends words. So how do you understand this in terms of your scientific mind? I don't understand it in my scientific mind at all and I don't try to. I was trained in traditional western medicine I have a very scientifically oriented background. I want to see the data. I want to see the, the evidence. Uh, when somebody tells me a drug works, I want to see the, the scientific studies that prove it. But when it comes to spiritual things, I'm open to feeling and trusting and going forward. And that came over a long period of time. That's part of the transition you asked me about in your first question about this journey to where I am now. Um, I didn't always trust that that spiritual inclination, that knowing. Um, I doubted it, and I went with things which were much more tangible for a long time in my life. And how do you continue to cultivate that? Like, how, do, how would you recommend one open this up? I mean, you were you had this experience. It was, it was almost really the experience with Jeff Olson, who, what you said in the last podcast is that you, you're able to talk about because you guys do all this work together. So it's pretty well known that you too, um, yeah, that he, yeah, he's would, not your patient anymore, right? He was never your patient, but he was, he's a friend and colleague and. Right. I wouldn't use his name publicly if he hadn't, uh, we didn't speak together and he's published a book. So I'm not violating any confidences either medically right. or uh, in, as a friendship. Um, <clears throat> and I lost your question. I forgot your no, question. No, no, no. But, but he was really kind of the impetus that opened you up. I mean, you were open, but that really opened you up even more so. Well, that was. After his experience. That was a profound experience, but I'd had many. Um, in fact, I, I've kept a daily journal for the last 40 years. And for the first time, uh, about eight months ago, I sat down and read the whole thing, read the 40 years of my life, which was kind of eye-opening. And I didn't record a lot of my spiritual experiences before I was 19. That's when I started keeping my journal. Um but there was one really interesting thing I did write in there. It was about a time when I was 19 years old and I went to a friend who was a few years older and who had a lot of experience in things and I trusted them. And without giving them any context at all, I used the vocabulary that was available to me as a young man. And I asked her, I said, does God ever speak to you in sentences? And uh, she looked at me, she kind of pointed her finger at me and had this very sincere look. And she said, don't ever doubt that. Hmm. And that was good advice for me. And that that entry in my journal told me that I must have had a number of experiences uh, in my teenage years that I don't remember that led me to that ask that question. Mm -hmm. um, so you asked me, how can people progress down this path? How can they have spiritual experiences? I, I do personal spiritual mentoring now. I meet with people one-on-one, -on -one and I speak publicly in large groups and stuff, but I meet one-on-one -on -one as well. And people often tell me they don't know how to have a spiritual experience, and I give them this exercise, which to my experience has never failed anyone. When you do your morning routine, when you get centered in the morning through prayer or meditation or exercise or whatever you do to get centered for the day, ask this one question. What can I do today to serve someone else? Mm -hmm. And I promise you, you'll get an answer. It might be a flash of somebody's face in your mind. It might be a thought to send somebody a card. It might just be pick up your phone and send them a text and said, hey, I was thinking of you. But if you honor that and act on it, you'll, you'll come to recognize it as a spiritual experience. And tomorrow, it'll be a little bit better, a little bit bigger, a little bit clearer. And every time you do it, it will become more a part of who you are and more comfortable in your spiritual nature. 
But how do you know what you hear is coming from outside of yourself versus inside yourself? People ask me that a lot. And for me, usually it's very clear. Usually I, I, I know a message when I get it from an external source. Uh, sometimes it's accompanied by visual experiences. Um, but sometimes it's subtle and I'm not entirely sure. And what I tell people is if, if you spend a lot of time and energy and ponder and meditate and you conclude that that message you got came from deep within yourself, it's still divine mm-hmm. because you're mm-hmm. divine. Right. And we are one and connected with Correct. This yes. larger consciousness. Yes. If you study almost any belief system, and I've studied a lot of them. I, I learned Hebrew to study the Torah. I, I studied the Bhagavad Gita and the, and the Quran. And, and uh, uh, whether you're talking about Hindus or Muslims or Buddhists, they'll almost always tell you that the answers are deep with inside you. And if you trust yourself and go forward and you're humble about it, you'll find the answer and it'll come from within. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I believe that pretty strongly. You just have to be quiet enough to hear it. Yeah, it's hard to be quiet in this day and age. There's mm-hmm. so many distractions. Mm-hmm. So I want to talk about your book for a little bit here because I pulled out some some pieces that really resonated with me. Uh, One of the first quotes I want to talk about is you say, when a diagnosis is made, all thinking stops. And I know that you were referring in that to specifically to kind of medical diagnosis. But how do you see this as it applies to what happens to us when we die and how we understand spirituality and, you know, just that piece of it? Well, if you think that you have a diagnosis in medicine, you stop looking because you feel that you have it and there's no reason to look further. The problem is that sometimes you have the wrong diagnosis and if you're not looking for something, you're not likely to see it. And uh, it's really perilous to go down a a wrong path. In, In law enforcement, they call it a rush to judgment. And if they make a conclusion about who did what too soon, it impedes the investigation. The investigation goes awry. And the same is true, I think, with our spirituality. If, if we come to a conclusion early on, there's no such thing as spirituality. We stop looking. We stop feeling. Uh, we stop trusting. We set ourselves up for a self-fulfilling prophecy. We never experience spirituality. Therefore, it doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. And so I think it's important to be open. And when people talk about spiritual experiences, I think we need to listen with our hearts more than our minds sometimes. Well, and you have to, it's, it's this which comes first, right? Do you have to believe to experience or do you have to experience to believe? Yes. <laughs> Maybe. It, it is a real chicken and an egg thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but almost all uh, spiritual uh, guys will tell you that things and having spiritual experiences is believing that you can and being open to them. And if you're open to them, then uh, you're more likely to experience it. Mm-hmm. And part of the way you get open to it is kind of this practice that you talked about. Yeah. Um, people are perfectly comfortable with the idea that you can be born with a given uh, gift of music, a profound gift for piano, for example, but you still have to practice 40,000 hours to be proficient and everybody's comfortable with that. But when it comes to spiritual gifts, they tend to think that they should come perfected already, ready to exercise and that it doesn't take any effort on our part to learn them or to grow into them. And I, I think just the opposite. You can practice your spiritual gifts and you can learn to uh, uh, accept them and use them and become more adapted to them. Mm. I like that. That makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, so let's talk about this veil, this veil that exists between life and death. You know, you, you say, whatever rejoicing we experience when a child is born in this earthly realm, the same rejoicing is magnified beyond the veil when someone dies. Birth and death are two ends of mortality, but they are only mile markers in our larger journey. So why can't we remember 
that larger journey. It's kind of a bummer. Yes, at first glance, it might sound like a bummer. But on the other hand, if you remembered, there'd be no purpose in you being here. The purpose of being here is to forget for a time in this illusion of mortality who you really are so that you can learn things and ultimately step more fully into your true identity, which is divinity and, uh, and the larger self, the higher you. And so we're here without the memory to enable us to learn and do things that we couldn't do if we had that memory. So it's literally the, the piece that is really the belief system about being mortal that drives so much for us. And, and shapes in so many ways how we how we live. I think so. Uh, I've always had the understanding or the belief that we were eternal divine beings, that we existed before birth and that we continue to exist after death. And that our mortality is simply a time for us to set aside a portion of that uh, knowledge and experience things anew, fresh, uh, to learn more fully empathy I think that is the big key. I think what, what we're here to learn is love, absolutely, but also empathy. Because mm-hmm. when you have empathy, when you look on another person with perfect empathy, you have no judgment. You only have love. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what the whole essence of this uh, existence is about. In your experience or just in what you know, you know, in the, what you just talked about here, is there sort of like a party happening on, or a fu- a funeral happening on the other side when, when our soul comes, comes here? Yes, I've actually used that analogy a number of times. We see birth as this wonderful time of rejoicing, and death we see as grief and sorrow. And, and the reason we view them that way is because we only see one side of each. We only see it from our current perspective. If we could see it from a higher perspective, we'd see the funeral on the other side of the veil at birth when people were weeping and comforting one another and saying, it's all right, You'll, he'll be back. He's just going for a little while. Don't worry about it. And conversely, at death, if we could see beyond the veil, we'd look right past the funeral and we'd see everybody in tears of joy welcoming home their loved ones and greeting one another one again, just the way we do when a child is born into this life. I think birth and death are essentially the same thing, just seen from a different perspective. If only babies could talk. Yes. Right? Like they could come right in and like report. You know, I know that there are kids that have had experiences, and they're more open and willing to kind of talk about their experiences than we are as adults. But can you imagine if all these little babies like were coming into the world saying, oh, my God, this place that I just was. Yeah. And, and in fact, uh, as you say, some, some children have spoken about that. I, I've read books of compilations of people who have had those kind of experiences with their children and written about them. And, and I believe that's true. It would just, I don't know. I I think that no matter what, people still have a hard time with the notion of mortality. Yes. The purpose of mortality would be thwarted in great uh, degree if we could remember uh, everything the way we once knew it and experienced it. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, a lot of these near-death experiencers that have had the experience certainly shift the way they live their lives as a result of that, typically. Yes, it's a big paradigm shift for most people who have had an out-of-body or near-death experience or a spiritually transformative experience. Um, what I ha- I've had some spiritually transformative experiences. What I described with uh, Jeff Olson's wife was what we call a shared death experience, mm-hmm. where someone passes and a perfectly healthy uh, uh, Spectator. Uh, spectator, yeah. Uh, uh, views it and has a transformative experience themselves. And uh, it changes people. It transforms who they are. It writes upon their soul and makes them a different person. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, and to think about you, who 
is a scientist embrace spirituality and and make it your life's work now right i mean you gave up yes i stopped seeing patients now um i had a messenger come to me uh one morning and uh the messenger said every experience is to enable you to help someone else I said, wait, whoa, 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 wait a minute. I said, I said, I thought experiences were for personal growth. And uh, my tutor on that occasion said, no, the primary purpose of every experience is to enable you to help someone else. You get the secondary benefit of personal growth. And it changed my whole perspective about why I go through difficult times, why I experience the things I do. It's not about me at all. It's to give me empathy and experience so that I can help somebody else that's struggling. And so in the midst of that, I crafted my personal mission statement. Uh, I exist to help souls heal. That's what I do. I, I don't, mm-hmm. I don't help them heal their bodies anymore. Now I help them heal their souls. Mm-hmm. So in the book, you also talk about life ne- not being about what you learned, but about what you live. How, what do you mean by that? And how can we, how can we embody that philosophy? Like really embrace that? I think what I was getting at when I wrote that was this contrast between my whole life of being left brain, Western medicine, scientific trained, show me the facts, ma'am. If you're old enough to remember uh, dragnet and uh, uh, it's all about show me the data, prove it to me. Mm -hmm. which is an okay way to live, especially if you're a scientist. But if you do that at the expense of your spirituality, you miss out on a whole other aspect of your life, which is feel with your heart and trust your intuition and go forward even when you may not see the end from the beginning uh, with confidence that you're being led in a divine path and let that balance things out for you. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and it's the contrast between book learning and actually living uh, in the moment. I, I used to think that living in the present was a cliche. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, yeah, 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 we, we can prepare for the future. We can uh, relive the past in our memory, but we, we got to be in the present. And I used to think that was all just a cliche. And then one day I realized something. You can only experience spirit in the now. You can remember what it felt like Mm -hmm. to experience it in the past, and you can anticipate experience it in the future, but you can only experience divine in the present. And then I became a believer of living in the present. Well, and uh, I'm trying to, I'm trying to think about how to say this in a way that doesn't, isn't redundant, but that, If you are not present, you can't see it either, right? You can't experience it. It's like you can only experience it in the present and you have to be present. I might be saying the same thing, but that if you are distracted, if you are preoccupied, if you are um, thinking about a million other things, you're going to miss the opportunities, the subtleties of spirit presenting itself. Yes, That's one of the reasons it's so important, as you mentioned, to find some quiet time, to find some alone time where you can tune into that, where you can get accustomed to it. And when you grow into it, when you've practiced it, when you, when in silence and solitude and meditation, you can experience it, eventually you learn to take it into the rest of your life and you learn how to stay connected to spirit, even when you're out on a run or a bike ride, or when you're in a crowd of people, you can still tune in and get connected, but it takes practice. Mm -hmm. So I want to end today with where you end your book, which is a quote that I feel like sums up so, so well. I mean, definitely, certainly how I, how, how I think about all of this. After all I have experienced, I'm still afraid. I'm not afraid of death. I'm afraid of the path through mortality. Yes. <clears throat> Earlier in the book, I talked about a very difficult, very dark and hard time in my life. 
And I was in a position where I asked for the privilege to go down this path because I thought I could help somebody else by doing it. I had no idea how hard it was going to be or I wouldn't have had the courage to ask. Naivete got me a long way down the path and I think it took me in the right place and I ultimately learned a great deal from it. But it was so hard, it made me nervous to ever ask again to go someplace. And I think there's some Mm -hmm. places we can't go unless we ask. And that's what I was getting at with that question, that statement in the book is, I'm not afraid to die. I actually look forward to dying. I struggle with envy when I go to a funeral and I'm uh, a little bit envious of the person in the casket. Mm -hmm. Um, The thing that makes Mm -hmm. me afraid is asking to take the next step because sometimes I'm afraid it's going to be a hard step and I'm not sure I want to go there, even Mm -hmm. though I know it's the right place to go. Mm-hmm. And and more, and being mortal is hard, being, right? I mean, yeah. being the, the living in a human body is hard. Yeah, and it's supposed to be hard. Um, this is one of the things I work with people a lot about. Um, we're here to be mortal, and so many faith traditions denigrate mortality. They talk about how we're sinful. They talk about how everything that we do that's mortal estranges us from the divine. And there's a lot of uh, shame that goes along with being mortal. And sometimes we forget the whole purpose of being here is to be mortal. It's okay to be mortal. That's what we're here for. Mm -hmm. And being mortal doesn't make us less divine. Mm. And being mortal helps us grow our souls. Right. Right. Exactly. That's what we're here for. Mm -hmm. Right. If we were going to do everything perfect, make no mistakes and not be mortal, there'd be no purpose in us being here. I mean, one could argue that the whole purpose of being here is to make mistakes. That's a, that's a paradigm shift. That could be a paradigm shift for people. Yeah. Well, I've had a few paradigm shifts in, in uh, my spiritual journey. Mm -hmm. So everybody make mistakes. Screw up. It's how you learn, right? I mean, we hear yeah. that all the time, but really it's how our soul grows. Like not only our, our person, but our soul. Right. And some people would argue that there are no such thing as mis- as mistakes. I'm not quite sure I'm, I buy into that entirely, but some people say there are no such thing as mistakes. Uh, every choice you make is to teach you something. And if you think it's a mistake, look what you learned from it. So I kind of see both sides of that argument. I'm kind of up in the air on it, frankly. I have learned I need to check and make sure I push the record button. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Pretty sure that was a mistake. (laughs) So you asked me about the last chapter in the book where I said that. When I was writing that last chapter, uh, I felt a spiritual presence. It was profound, and it was, pro- it was prolonged until I finally asked. I didn't recognize who it was at first. I finally said, who are you? And he said, I'm your brother. And I kind of, oh, I said, well, what do you want me to do? Because I found that those two questions really open a lot of doors when it comes to spiritual experiences. Who are, who are you, you? And what do you want me to do? Yeah. And so I asked, what do you want me to do? And he said, keep going. And initially, I thought he was talking about the book, but I was literally writing the last two sentences of the book at the time. And then later, I realized, I think, more what he was talking about. I was going to my first public speaking engagement in Boston, and I was sitting in the airport waiting for my plane, and this couple came and sat down next to me and started to chat with me and asked me the usual, where are you going, what are you doing? When they found out I was going to be speaking, and they found out my topic, the, the woman's countenance just totally changed. And she said, my grandfather's come to me a couple of times. uh, Or she said, my grandfather just died and he's come to me a couple of times since. And I initially wondered why in the world would uh, this total stranger share such an intimate thing with me? And then I realized that I was a safe place and she realized that I believed her and that it was okay to talk. And, and she took one of my books and she went and got on her plane and, uh, I'd been an emergency physician for 25 years by then. I estimated I'd seen in excess of 60,000 patients. And I got on the plane to go to Boston, and uh, on on the ride to Boston, the spirit that speaks to my heart, that voice that I've heard for so many years, spoke to me and said, you will help more people with this book than you helped as a physician in the emergency department. Hmm. 
And it changed my whole perspective about sharing and how to help people heal. And I think what my brother was talking about when he said, keep going, he was talking about keep speaking, keep writing. I'm halfway through my writing my next book and uh, keep teaching and helping people help them heal. I think that's what he was talking about. Mm -hmm. And so if people are interested in you, where can they find you? My website is helpingsoulsheal.com. Um, my book, Not Yet, is available there, but it's also available on Amazon and Kindle. And uh, I'm on Facebook. People can find me on Facebook. Um, I think I'm pretty easy to find. Well, and, and all of this will be in the show notes as well for people if they're interested. So thank you so much for double time today. <laughs> Um, another great conversation, even though people will not get to hear the first one, I got to experience the first one. So just opening my mind, you know, my eyes a little bit more, helping me think of questions that I can ask to continue to grow my spirituality is, is really helpful. So thank you. Oh, you're welcome. It was wonderful to be with you twice. <laughs> <laughs> once with a beard, once without a beard, transformations happening all over the place, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right, well, have a great weekend. Thank you, you too. Thanks. Like what you heard today and want to hear more? Curious about what comes next and what it all means? You can subscribe on iTunes. Just go to podcasts and find life, death, and the space between and hit subscribe. And you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Dr. Amy Robbins. Ask me any questions you might have. Let me know what else you'd love to hear about or just share your story. I can't wait to hear from you.